chapter 1. In this version, my daughter does not exist. The principal of Euclid Heights High School tells me what I already know. We have no record of a Penelope Winkler, no birth certificate, no social security number, no inoculation records, no grades at any academic level. If you are able to provide any of that documentation, we will be happy to enroll your daughter. Penny was an excellent student, I say, at this school. She had friends at this school. She shouldn't be punished for something I did. Mr. Winkler, the principal says, we're all familiar with, he glances at his colleagues, three men and a woman. Your story, I personally don't believe it, but I understand that at this particular time, your news, which makes us, or our decision regarding your purported daughter, news. We're being watched. We have to follow the rules to the letter. Not that we don't anyway, the woman interjects. Mr. Winkler, the principal continues, we base our enrollment decisions on the evidence presented to us. She has nowhere else to go, I say. Where is Penelope now, the woman asks. I'm not sure. She's mad at me. Is she, you know, in this time, now, the principal asks. Yes, I nod. At least I think she is. You could homeschool her. That would require she come home. The principal says, Mr. Winkler, when you... He pauses and makes a back-and-forth motion with his hands. I want to be helpful. Travel through time, I say? He nods, almost reluctantly. What happens, he asks. I can't exactly say. It's not something I try to do. The woman chimes in. You can't exactly say because it never exactly happens. The mood is souring. It always does. I stand and ask the principal, is there a back door? A janitor leads me through empty halls. You're the time guy, he says. You must be cashing in big time. I could use some cashing in schemes. How? He thinks for a moment, as short of ideas as I am. You could endorse a watch or something, he says, and then switches to his announcer voice. When the time guy goes into the future, he keeps track of where he is on a Timex whatever. We reach a door. This leads west, he says. Which way you headed? West is good. Where to? Home, I say. Hopefully. Really? He's disappointed. You come back when school starts and the kids are here, I'll pay you to take me back to right now. Nice and quiet, no bells, no punk-ass kids. He taps my chest with the back of his hand. That's your market, taking people where they'd rather be. I cut on the northwest diagonal away from the school. Football and band practice whistles chirp in the distance. The TV camera crews and reporters are on the far side of the building, staking out the door I'd used going in. Rick Dawkins of the Bugle will probably be the first to see me trying to get away. He's a newspaper reporter, first of all, and a little more dogged than the others. He wrote the first article about me. At the time, Penny and I were freshly returned from 1918. She didn't exist in a documented official capacity, and her mother didn't know her. I was married to a different woman than before. Our new version had just begun. I discovered you, Rick Dawkins likes to say. I reach Mill Road, the northern boundary of the high school's property, eyes averted like I'm trying to flee a hit-and-run accident. No one calls out or fires five questions at a time at me or asks if I'm making it all up. Straight ahead across Mill Road is a familiar neighborhood of grid streets and anonymous houses where I might slip away. My luck ends when I have to pause and wait for a passing car. The girl behind the wheel points at me. I can read her lips. Time traveler! And then she taps her horn. I wince. A moment passes. Then Rick Dawkins calls out, Josh! I refuse to acknowledge him. Josh! Across Mill Road, I hurry down the nearest intersecting street, Spinney. It's about two miles from there to our apartment above a barber shop downtown. My wife, Lee, is at work. She dispatches at the 911 emergency center. She long ago had her fill of me in public as the time guy. My plan is to get home and out of sight. The reporters always lose interest and go away, eventually. They have deadlines to meet, other responsibilities. TV, with its short attention span, will leave first, followed by newspaper reporters who have been assigned to me because everyone else is covering me. It's hard to be devoted to what you don't believe. They lack the personal commitment of Rick Dawkins, who will leave last and reluctantly in the dead of night, if then. A TV van crawls up alongside me as I half-walk, half-run down Spinney Street. A woman in the passenger seat leans across the driver. Josh, want a lift? I politely decline and turn west at a cross street. 
A lost dog poster flaps on a utility pole. Cocker Spaniel answers to baby. I head north again at Chapman. A news chopper correspondent might remark on my stair-step progress toward home, but it has been months since a helicopter was detailed to shadow me. In the first days, the worst days, there have been three. You going to the house? asked the woman in the van. The house. 218 Clover Street, one block to the north and one block to the west. A version of me lived there once. Let us give you a lift, the TV woman offers. Come on, man, the driver coaxes. We believe you. There's one, the woman calls excitedly. I stop dead. Up ahead, in the middle of the block, a paved walkway meets the sidewalk I'm on at a perpendicular angle, which is why I call them perp walks. This one, like all of them, runs between two houses to the next block over. A chain of perp walks extends several blocks from there to the west and a couple blocks to the east. There was a time when I couldn't stay off of them. They changed my life. I set foot on one in 1918 because I needed to get back to now. I learned my lesson. I haven't set foot on one since.